It should be a husband day, a wife day. There should be all these days. Because how many know in the kingdom of God, we don't just use a day. No. We once, once a year say, hello, I got such a great dad. No, it should be something all year round, mothers, sons, whatever. It's the way that we live. We appreciate one another and we care for one another. So what the Lord gave me today will probably never be preached again. I'm almost sure it will not. And it just came to me this week, so I'm going to go ahead and share it with you. Praise God. All right, John chapter 11. Are you there? Yeah. Yes. Look at verse 32. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou had been here, my brother Lazarus would not have died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold, how he loved him. And some of them said, Could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself, cometh to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take ye away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was dead, Lazarus, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinks, for he has been dead how many days? Four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou would believe, thou would see the glory of God? Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. I knew that thou hearest me always, but because of the people which stand here, I said that, so that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he thus had spoken, he cried with a loud voice and said, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto him, Loose him, and let him go. Say, Loose him, Loose him. and let him go. Let him go. Now, we could talk about the glory of God. We could talk about raising from the dead. We could talk about all these different things. But what I want to talk about this morning is, first of all, I want you to know that Lazarus was dead. He was dead for four days. Jesus came, raised him from the dead, and said, Loose him and let him go. Now, how, how many of you know Lazarus was a man? Yes. He had two sisters, according to this. He had Mary and he had Martha. We don't know much else about Lazarus. How many of you know that? So this morning, I may do some speculating. Say speculating. speculating. In other words, I may speculate some things in Lazarus's life that may not be biblical, may not be proved, but may not be disproved either. Are you following me? Yeah. Yeah. So if you want to leave and say, well, Pastor Tom said he had this and he had that and he didn't. I can't find it in the Bible. You ain't going to find it in the Bible. So just relax and enjoy, okay? Praise God. No, All right. When I thought about Lazarus, he'd been dead how many days? Four. Four. I thought, I wonder what Lazarus was thinking about. While he was laying there four days in the grave. Mm. Maybe first of all he was thinking about all that he did in his life up to that point. He worked two jobs, worked his tail off to provide for his family and did a good job. Probably had a big beautiful house someplace with a swimming pool. He probably drove a family camel, one of the finest ones that they made, <laughs> praise God. And he had saved a lot of money at that time. But all at once, all the things that he did meant absolutely nothing because he was dead. No longer lived in the house, no longer going to ride his camel again, and no longer spend his money ever again. Then I thought maybe he was thinking about what he didn't do. You know, we not don't know for sure, but maybe Lazarus had a wife. If he did have a wife, she wasn't there at the tomb when he died and was in there four days. Maybe, maybe he had kids, but his children were nowhere to be found when he was laying there in the grave. The only two people there were his wife, his sisters of Martha and Mary. So maybe he was thinking at that time, I should have spent a little more time with my wife. I should have spent more time with my kids when they were growing up. I should have invested more time into that than all the work that I did and all the toys that I had and everything that I had. And I'd love to do that, but I'm dead. I've already died. I can't do that anymore. Then he had to probably think that I would think, did I even make a difference while I was in the world? Did I really help anybody? Did I do anything before I died? Did I hug the last person that I loved before I passed away and before I died? Did I say something nice about them that I wanted to say about them? Or was I mad at them that day and I just gave them a piece of my mind and told them and then I died and now I'm gone and I can't do anything about it because I'm dead? So as he's sitting there thinking all this stuff, was I too busy for the worldly stuff? Is it too late for what to do? What should I do? What's going on? What does my wife think? What does my kids think? Did I do anything productive? But I can't change it because I'm dead. And then we find the two sisters. The two sisters were mad. They said, Jesus, 
If you'd have been here, he'd have never died. Right. Now, my question really deep down is, were they mad because Jesus wasn't there to raise him? Or were they mad because the way they treated Lazarus before he died, they felt guilty and had to blame someone else? Oh, yeah. See, maybe they were mad about that. Maybe the last time they saw Lazarus, they told him to go to H. <laughs> Come on, maybe they had a little fight. Maybe they had a little discussion. Mary, take a, Martha, take a break. For God's sake, you're always running around the place doing everything like this. And, and well, I don't like you either. And that's all there is. And then all once he died, and, and what? It, maybe maybe they thought basically that they could do something about it. But how many know after someone dies, you really can't do anything about what took place or what happened? Or maybe they got upset at some stupid little thing that took place that day. And then Lazarus died and then he felt bad the rest of their life because some stupid thing that they did before that latched with them and stayed with them. Sometimes we can get so caught up in the little issues of life. Come on, that we get all upset about some stupid things. We get upset. Husbands and wives get mad over the dumbest things. Families get mad over the dumbest things. People in the congregation get mad over the dumbest things yeah. in the world, little issues that make them mad and get them all upset. The Bible says we brought nothing into this world, but we will take nothing else out. Well, I disagree with that scripture because I believe you're going to take something out. You may take your regrets out. You may take your offenses with you. You may leave behind some hurts and some other things. Maybe there's some disagreements or there's some missed opportunities after you die to say, gosh, I should have did that. Gosh, I should have did this. Gosh, I should have did that. When you die, will people be glad or will they be sad? Depending on how you lived your life up to that time. All these little things that steal our peace, steal our joy, uh, get us all upset. All these little things really in the end do not make that much difference if you look at it from a kingdom and a right perspective. Now in our, in our marriage, we've been married now 38 years, been together 138. And basically there's some things in a marriage that seem to irritate you and make you mad. Now our marriage may be the only one like that. Most of you in here probably don't have those things. Well, one of the things in our marriage that started day one and still goes on to this day was basically I like to be on time. My wife doesn't care whether she's on time or not. So back in our younger years, I'm looking at the watch, I'm pacing back and forth, I'm telling her we're going to be late, I'm telling her we're not going to make it, I get all upset, all up irritable. But as you get older and you start to see things, say see things. See things. I've made a decision in the last 10 years, and that is I would rather show up late with her by my side than have her dead and show up on time. So I said, how can I get upset for that? I'm just glad we're gone. I'm just glad we're still together. Amen. I'm just glad Amen. we're still doing something. Yes. Another thing when we get in the car, you know, sometimes she's, if you have no Becky, she's got a water glass here and a coffee glass here and, and rolls between her arms and everything else when she gets in the car and sits down. So we start driving and of course the seatbelt, ding, 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 ding. And after about the 15th ding, I say, honey, you know, you may want to fasten your seatbelt, but by the time she gets to it, the ding's over anyway, really, and I'm ding, so it's all there. And that used to irritate me. But when you stop and think about it in the big picture of life, yes, there's someday I'm going to get in the car and I'm going to miss that day. Yeah. Yeah. Or someday she's not going to be there anymore. When I get in the car, I'm praying that that thing would ding, ding, ding. But how many know it's too late? And it's too late for me to, to tell her how stupid I was for getting mad at the ding, ding, ding and being three minutes late, praise God. I mean, I mean, you women out there, maybe you've got a husband who basically throws her underwear and her socks in the hallway all the time. I don't know what's the matter with this man. Right there's the hamper, right there's the socks. Put the socks in the hamper. Could you just do that for me? My God. Arr, 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 arr. But there's going to come a day when you walk out of your room, you're going to pray those socks and underwear are laying there. Come on. Because they're gone now and you can't do anything about it anymore. So these little irritations that just, oh, I'm also upset. I'm, I'm good. I didn't know what to do about it. I mean, my mother now, she's 91 years old. And I call her, try to call her once a week. And every time I call her, I hear the same stories over and over and over. And every time I call, she says, did you, I ever tell you this one? And I say, no. And she tells me the story again. Because I'd rather hear the story again than not be able to hear the story again. Amen. Are you following me? Amen. So it changes. Oh, I just don't want to call her anymore. My God drives me nuts. The same story. I can tell it frontwards, backwards, sideways. Every place that I go, I can tell the thing. But that's not the point. The point is, in the kingdom, we deal with people. We deal with wives. We deal with friends. We deal with church members. We deal with all these things. And it makes a difference what we do, praise God. You know, sometimes, even in our life, you know, I snore and sometimes she snores a little bit. 
<laughs> but I'm a big snorer and she can't sleep and I'm a very light sleeper so when she snores a little I can't do it but once again there's going to be one day that I wake up that I wish she was snoring a side of me or she's wishing that I was snoring a side of her do you see and all these are the little things that get at us the little things that happen but once we leave here how many know you're not going to be able to rectify any of those things that were already done because they're basically gone and they're gone and you can't basically do anything about it and who knows by next Father's Day, the person on your right may not be here anymore. The person on your left may not be here anymore. We don't know for sure, praise God. That's why, you know, I heard one time, live every day, it's just like your last, and one day you'll be right. <laughs> live every day like I said. So I'm going to walk in peace with everyone. I want to impart, uh, you know, wisdom to my children yet and my grandchildren coming up. I'm already working on her, praise God. She goes to birdies and she knows it, whatever. <laughs> But, but these are things I want to impart before I get out of here, do you see? And family's family. You know, I got two what they call daughters-in-law, which I think is a bunch of crap. Once they're married in, there's your daughter. There's no in-law stuff there, praise God. I didn't raise them, but bless God, they're mine now. Do you understand? They belong to me. And all these things, I want to leave everybody something. I want to leave it. And that's why the book was really important to me because of the fact that that book will be here. One day, you know, she'll grow up. Talon will grow up. She'll have kids. And she'll say, here, this is Grandpa's book that he wrote. 50 years ago, and here it is, and you can pass it down. But there's still something there, do you see what I mean? Where you can make an impartial and you do things. But the little things that we get about arguing and fussing and moaning, and, and I'm telling you, when Lazarus got raised from the dead, how I many you know he said, wow, all that stuff I thought about, I can do something about now. I can go hug my two sisters again. I can have a better relationship with Jesus like I should have had in the first place. The grass is green. I used to complain all my life about mowing it, but I'm just glad it's green in there. The sky is blue. It's hotter than heck out here, but I love the sun and I love the heat. All the little things we complain about all the time. Yeah, yeah. Someday you're going to wish you had the sun out and wish you had a yard to mow. Come on. Because that's the way it's going to operate here as we go on and on and on and on and on. Praise God. So Jesus comes to Lazarus and he says, loose him and let him go. I believe not only was he raised, but he was let go of a lot of things. Yeah. That he was hanging on to him. He had four days to think about this. Some of you can think about a million things in an hour. <laughs> he had four days to think about this. You know, I hope he didn't have a pencil and pad. He probably ran all kinds of stuff down there. And he would have did different with the kids and raised them right. And how many of you, you young dads, you just love your kids. You raise your kids. You put your time in. And when you get done, you're going to say, man, I made a bunch of mistakes. But you did a bunch of good stuff too, praise yes. God. As a dad, you did what you knew how the best you could. I mean, my generation are better dads than the generation before me. I'll tell you that right now. I know the generation. I know my aunts and uncles from before and how they did it. But they just did it the way they knew how to do it, you see? So that's great. But we're growing. We're, we're going to do it this way. Yeah. Amen. We're not going to do it the way great-great-grandpa did it. We're not going to do it the way our cousins did it. We're going to do it this way. Amen. Yes. And we're going to grow these Come kids on. up. And then when our kids get up there, they're going to do it this way. Right. And they're going to be able to do it. So I'm sure when he came out of the tomb, it was a happy, happy day. Not just because he was alive again, because there's so many things he could do. And notice his priorities. Look at John chapter 12 now. Look at verse 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper with Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment and spikenard very costly and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his hair with her hair and the house was filled with the odor of ointment. Once again, I don't believe that she did that to his feet simply because he raised him from the dead because it released her of her guilt, the guiltiness that she did something to her brother, didn't tell him he was the best brother in the world, didn't have an opportunity to say it, and now she had that second chance. But here it says the first thing they did, they had a supper together. He went back to his sisters. His sisters came back to him. They're going to sit down and eat. They're going to get along now. They're going to love each other now. And notice Jesus was there. Say Jesus was there. Jesus. And the Bible says that what did he do? He sat at table. Another one said he rested at table. Another one said he reclined at table. I love this one. Jesus said Lazarus just hung out with Jesus. <laughs> and, you know. Now, before we found out that Lazarus was the person that Jesus loved. I believe when he was raised and had a chance to change things, he was now the person that loved Jesus. Yeah. In other words, it wasn't a one-way street anymore. In other words, he's going to hang out with Jesus wherever Jesus was at. That's what he was going to do. And men, you know, we back at the beginning, man was created, and man was created and put in the Garden of Eden. The Garden of Eden is the presence of God. The first thing he did with man, say men. Amen. Women wasn't even around yet. Men Amen. was to put them in the presence of God. Why is that? Because it's the most important thing in a man's life to spend time with God alone, praise God. And I know you've heard this before, and I know do it, but I'll tell you what, it'll change your life. 
Look at John. He had a two-hour conversation in the middle of the night. I go on the back porch and I sit there and, and I'm talking to God with the squirrels running around and the birds flying all overhead and everything and just sit down and have time with Jesus because that's, that's more important than the two jobs. It's more important than the big car. It's more important than everything else that we do. The importance is having a relationship with Jesus. All right, look at verse 9. It says, Much people of the Jews therefore knew that he was there and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but that they might see Lazarus also, whom they had raised from the dead. Now this is interesting. In other words, everywhere they went and found Lazarus, they found Jesus. Everywhere they went and found Jesus, they found Lazarus. So it must be Lazarus and Jesus were spending quite a bit of time together. See? And they got mad. They got mad. He got a second chance. Lazarus got a second chance. I'm never going to get a second chance. He was dead four days, and he should be dead, brother. I'm telling you right now, and that's the way that should be, praise God. But that's just not the way it is because he got a second chance. And I may not get a second chance, which they probably wouldn't have. How many of you know that? Yeah. So they were mad at him. What for? To get a second chance, to be able to do things. Now, let me help you this morning. You don't have to die to get a second chance. Amen. Hallelujah. See, it's Father's Day today. It's almost noon. Everybody's running to get the front seat at the restaurants right now. You're going to be a little late, so just hang in there, praise God, and that'll be all right. <laughs> but basically, you can start today. Well, I haven't been doing it right. Well, then do it right. I haven't told my wife I love her lately. Better do it. I haven't held her hand lately. Do it. I haven't, you know, told them how much I appreciate. Do it. Uh, I'm Treasure Coast Victory Center, and I need to tell my fellow brothers and sisters how much I care about. Do it, praise God. Amen. Don't wait till after you die or someone else dies that you want to say that to. Right. Because you can't do it then. It's already gone. I can remember way back when I was a young kid, 19 years old, went to Florida to go to college. My mom and my sister took me down there, my older sister, and basically they were leaving, dropped me off down there. They were going to fly back, left the car with me, and I went to the airport, and there was a delay on the flight, and it was like two hours, and mom and my sister said, go, you know, you need to go. Two hours, I said, no, I'm going to stay here and see you guys off and hug you when you get on the plane and go, and I did that. Well, while I was down in college, my older sister got in an automobile accident, and basically she was semi-comatose or basically out of it for the rest of her life, and I thought to myself, the last memory I've got is spending two hours of my time and giving her a hug before she got on that air. And it made me deal with her situation so much better because it not if I have said, I ain't sitting here two hours with you. Bless God, I'm in Florida now. Get out of here. I'm going to the beach today. I can get it. How many know I wouldn't feel so well? And I'd want to get there and say, hey, I'm sorry I put the beach over you. For God's sakes, I don't know what you were thinking about. And it's that way people say, as a pastor, you see a lot of death. You do. How many of you know that? You guys got family death. I got family deaths. Yeah. <laughs> So I see it all the time. But you learn to cope with it, and you learn to cope with it by making every day your last day on earth where you're loving and being kind to everybody. How I many you know the law of the kingdom is love your neighbor as yeah, yourself? Yeah. We want to brush over it, praise God. So when people in the church who are very special to me, I mean Mitzi, praise God, got sick, and I came down to the house that day, and she, we were going, she was going to go to the hospital, and I got a chance to see her, and I walked her out in the driveway, and you know, before she went, I got a chance to give her a big hug and tell her I love her, put her in the car, Jim her took her to the hospital, never got to see her again, but the last last vision I have of her, do you follow me? Yeah. It's me hugging her in old drive, driveway, and how many know Mitzi's a good hugger? Yeah. So we had a real good hug and everything, and she went to be with the Lord, but there was peace in my heart, for that day because basically now I think back and that's what I do. Lou's another one. You know, I was going over to Lou's house and I spent an hour every couple days praying with him, doing this with him. And the last day I was there, I prayed and I declared healing on his body in a side room that they had in the house there. And basically we sat down and I put my hand down and he put his hand on mine and I said, what do you want to do now? And of course he turned on, I don't know if it was Bonanza or the Big Valley. He loved the old westerns. <laughs> so he turned one of them on and we just sat there and watched the Big Valley for a little bit, you know, make sure everything was going good, and we left, and those are the memories, you see, that you have. Yeah. You don't want to have memories where you're mad at your yeah. dad, or you screamed at your kid, or you did this stuff. You never know what's coming down the road, and because of that, you know, I got in the habit of, and I still do it, when my kids leave my house, I'm outside with them. I never just sit in the lounge and say, okay, see you later, you come back. No, I'm going to see them off. Do you see what I mean? It's always been that way. I'm going to walk them out. When my parents used to come down, I'd walk them out. When my wife went to work in the morning when she was going back, when, when cruising was up and all that stuff, I walked her out every morning before she left. Why is that? Because I want to have a vision of unity and love. and I don't want to be guilty when something happens. I don't want to be that way. I want to appreciate my family. I want to appreciate my kids. I want to appreciate my wife. I want to appreciate them every day. Not, Mom, you stink, but when Mother's Day comes back around, praise God, we're going to have a good time together. Dad, you stink too, but I'm going to take you out to eat on Father's Day. 
It shouldn't be that way. This should be a lifestyle yeah. Yeah. where we appreciate each other, where we care for each other, where we want to be, praise God. So live every day as if it's your last. And you know what? You'll be right. Yeah. Another, another one of my favorite things is nobody's getting out of here alive. <laughs> Unless the rapture happens, nobody's getting out of here alive. And I'm going to leave you with one other thing, and I'm going to ask your apology for this. This is my brother's statement, not mine. <laughs> So this may be PG. My brother Gary, if you know him, or his, guy, his, kid, his favorite saying is, and always has been, life's a bitch and now you die. <laughs> but I found that's not true. I found that life is what you make it of, and then you die. Yeah. If it's a B-I-T-H, it's because you making it. Oh, yeah. Come on now. Yeah. You're the one making it. You're the one responsible for that. So you make out of your life whatever you want to make out of your life. Amen. So the word this morning is, wives, love your husbands. Yeah. Yes, yes. Husbands, love your wives. Yes, yes. Parents, love your kids. Yes, yes. Kids, love your parents even when they tell you what to do. Praise yeah. God, you do that. Now. <laughs> love your relation. Love fellow TCVCites. Yes. Help each other out. Pray for each other. So today I just say, come forth, praise God. And if you've got any issues, be loosed yes. and be let go. Hallelujah. Yes. Now I wish you a happy Father's Day. Praise God.